guess you could see Mary Jean fanning me. I don't know what, all of a sudden, I was doing fine this morning. I'm just burning up right now. I don't know what's going on with me, but just pray for me. And maybe I'll cool off. Uh, on this World Communion Sunday, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the scripture this morning, and then we're going to uh, follow up. Uh, with the communion uh, service in our hymnals, and it's on page, it starts on page 12, word, service of word table 2. And uh, so you can, you know, you can kind of look at that uh, or have, it, uh, have your hymnals open there. We'll, we'll follow up with that a little bit later. You know, is a is a theme we've been talking about for the last couple of months. It's, it's about tra transformation. Uh, you know, I think back. Uh, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, and uh, and I think that there was a transformation of Jesus when he came up out of the water. You know, we know that God spoke. Uh, about the event and about Jesus and about his pleasure of what had just taken place. Um, I don't know if you can compare the two, but I told you uh, here recently about my own <coughs> baptism, about coming up out of the water and, and the change that I felt in my life. Um, I just want to remind you a definition that, that I've been reading several times, and I just, I, I just really drawn to this definition. It kind of sums it up very well. It says transformation then is the effort to become holy by fully submitting to God and consistently pursuing His will, being set apart by the blood of Christ to experience a unique freedom, a new identity through the power of the blood and the enduring guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that, to me, it's, it's hard to improve on that. That's a, that's a great definition of trans transformation. <clears throat> you know, as, as I mentioned uh, in my prayer today, being World Communion Sunday, you know, I, I had time to sit back and reflect past days just exactly it's just to me it was a special thought of how many people were going to be doing exactly the same thing for exactly the same reason all over the world today taking the Holy Communion and uh You've heard me say before, there are times in my life when, when it was just a matter of eating a cracker and drinking some juice. But now in my life, in my later years, I, I think I've come to realize and acknowledge the significance of what we're actually doing. And uh, it makes it all that more meaningful to me. But just a few thoughts. Uh, you know, all four Gospels uh, record uh, the Last Supper with varying differences and varying emphasis on it. Uh, you know, here uh, Jesus tells his disciples to go into the city and find a man with a house to, to get ready to do that. It kind of reminds me of him sending his disciples into the city to find a colt for him to ride in on, you know, just a week before, or a few days before, actually. And uh, it's not recorded in Matthew, but in, uh, 
another gospel, Jesus is very specific and he says, look for a man carrying a jar of water. And, you know, each gospel uh, has their own style. But you know what's significant about that is carrying a jar of water is woman's work. You never saw a man in Jerusalem carrying a jar of water. So the significance of that is, is he would be very easy to recognize. Because he's probably the only man in Jerusalem carrying a jar of water. And so all they had to do was follow that guy to the house and they found the man who owned the house where the last supper would take place. It says, so the, G the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. And then in verse 20, uh, Matthew starts out by saying, when the evening came, it was time for the Passover meal. Jesus had gathered with his disciples around, it doesn't say that, but generally around the table, probably, a very short table, like, much like a coffee table. And they were probably, rec uh, they were reclining, probably on some pillows, leaning back, taking it easy. And, uh, and what was interesting about this is that was customary of how they ate their meals in that day. They just kind of lay back, take it easy. They didn't have the typical dining room table and chairs like we have today. They would just sit back, take it easy, recline on the pillow, lean on the elbow next to one another. What's interesting about this uh, is this is not how it was originally done. It kind of evolved into that. If you go back to Leviticus, the early parts, the recording of the Passover meal, the Passover meal was taken standing up. And I thought that was interesting. And so, in uh, recognition of that, I want us to take communion today standing up. You want to stand along. But uh, after we get through the liturgy and the, and the hymnal, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to come up. And there's only eight of us, so it won't be that big of a deal. We're just kind of standing here. We stand in a line, stand in a circle, whatever. And we're just going to take the, uh, the Lord's Supper standing up. Just the way they did it back 3,000 years ago here. And you know, they're, they're sitting there relaxing. And, and one thing to remember that when Jewish people, Hebrew people, people of that region, that, uh, that heritage, sitting down and eating a meal with someone was a very intimate setting. Uh, it would be like if, if Clarence Needs invited us over to their house for lunch today. For them to invite us over there, typically you just wouldn't invite strangers. It would be people that you cared about. People that you loved. People that you didn't feel threatened by. And by us attending their house for, for a meal, for sitting down and sharing the food at their table, we're actually saying to Clarence and Edith, we're your friends. We love you. And we would never harm you. It's a very intimate setting. Very personal setting. It's not just, hey, are you hungry? Come on over, I'll feed you. This is a very intimate, personal setting. And that's what we have here with this Passover meal with Jesus and his most trusted friends, confidants,
followers. And then Jesus throws them a curveball. Something that none of them were expecting. He says, I tell you the truth, one of you are going to betray me. Even though you have sat here at the meal and you've, you've ate together, you've traveled together the last three years, faithful followers, one of you is going to turn your back and betray me. You know, the, the only thing Just a couple of things that I could just think of, of being in a football locker room and a coach standing up and saying that to you. Singling one of us out as a traitor to the football team. Can't imagine that. Can't imagine being in the army and a commanding officer come up and singling out one of his soldiers in this platoon. Hey, one of you is a traitor. Boy, it was just shocking turn of events that I don't see anyone saw coming. And as we read, Judas spoke up and Jesus confirmed, yes, Jesus, you're the traitor. You're the one who is going to betray me. <clears throat> now it doesn't say it here. But I firmly believe at that moment when the curtain was pulled back and everybody saw who Judas really was. I believe he got it Now, everybody, some people may have a different opinion of that. That's just kind of how I feel with what happened. Uh, Judas was discovered. And uh, you know, I just can't imagine a traitor being called out in such a close-knit cl close group of friends and him be able to sit there any longer. I'm surprised there's not a story here about the other was chasing him. But I guess. But I think that he left at this point in time. And then in Matthew's Gospel, as we read today, we see that Jesus, you know, they, they had been nibbling, eating appetizers, enjoying their. Time. And then Jesus does something significant. So he takes the bread and he breaks it. He takes the cup and passes it. And th this is totally different than all the other events of the evening they've done before. And he goes on to tell them reminds them of exactly what just took place and them eating the bread and drinking the wine. It says, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you, my Father's King. You know, I have been in different churches, different denominations. And, and, and a lot of people have different polity and protocol about how they go about serving uh, Holy Communion. I have... Uh, I've always been proud of the fact that the United Methodist Church has an open table. It is not for me as the 
so-called ranking official person in the church here to exclude anyone from that. You know, I think as you've always heard me say it most every time, you know, the table is open and all are welcome. We invite everyone to come. Whether you're a Methodist, Baptist, or whatever. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a member of the church or not a member of the church. And, uh, and, and I may have been a, a little bit too open with that, but uh, I think I got the point across to everyone. But you know, the, the United Methodist Church does have conditions and stipulations on communion. And it's right in the very beginning of the invitation. And, uh, and you have probably heard these words hundreds if not thousands of times in your life. But here's what it says. In the invitation. I'll read this again in a minute. But here's what it says. Christ our Lord invites to his table all. Follow right along with what I was saying, all of them. But there are three stipulations here. All who love him. A stipulation number one. Do you love Jesus? Number two. Who earnestly repent of their sins. You've heard me say this many times. Never really understood the penance. I kind of equated that with was being sorry that I got caught. Doing something I shouldn't do. There's nothing to do with that. Repentance is turning away. 180 degrees in the other direction. You earnestly repent of your sin and earnestly seek to live in peace with one another. Remember what Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all your soul, mind, body, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I guess uh, if you could sum up my ministry over the years, it, it would be very simple. It would, it would say, love one another. And you've heard me say this many, many times. If we did exactly what Jesus said to do, if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and we loved our neighbor as ourselves. If we loved one another. We did those two things. The earth would almost be a perfect place to live. We would almost be back in the Garden of Eden. But we all realize that it's very hard to attain. Probably not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I want to make perfectly clear here is, is while the United Methodist Church, and I think the intent here is that there are conditions and stipulations on the Lord's Supper, I'm not the judge of jury. I'm not the one who gets to make that choice. That's a personal decision for each one of us. Do we feel like we that we comply with those conditions. Do we love Jesus? Do we earnestly repent of our sins? And do we seek to live in peace with one another? I, I, I think we could all sit here and say that we know someone or have known someone in our lives that it seems like their life exists to stir the pot. You know, it just seems like they're always trying to stir up trouble. It just doesn't matter what they do. I 
And I'm not judging your, but you know, I've seen a lot of those folks, they just come right on down and take communion, just like anybody. But you know, that's between them and you. It's not for me to decide. You heard me quote it many times, one of my favorite scriptures. It's short, so I can remember it. Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest you be judged. It's not, here for, it's not for me to judge anyone with us. You know, the Lord's table. That's, it's a personal decision, a personal relationship in each one of us with God. But I just want you to know that uh, the United Methodist Church is an open, open and welcoming church. But we... Uh, Also believe in doing a Friday. If you would uh, join me uh, on page twelve in the in the hymnal, uh, and where there is, we're, we're going to do almost all of this. There's an offering in here which we've already done, so we'll skip that. But everywhere that there is bold type, I ask you to join me in reading it with me, and then I'll read the, the lighter type. We'll, uh, we'll go all the way down to the Lord's Prayer, uh, and then uh, after the Lord's Prayer, I will uh, invite you to come forward, and then we'll uh, take all the communion together, receive it. <clears throat> Okay, on page 12, starting with the invitation. Christ our Lord invites all to his table who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us offer uh, signs of love and peace to one another as we shake hands and with one another. Everybody can stand up. some reason I'm just sweating. I don't know if I'm getting sick or what. But, but probably better I not shake your hand. Okay, let's continue on page 13, the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, 
and praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and Glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now I would invite you, all seven of you, to come up here and uh, gather here at the front. We can just... Get a semicircle or gather around here, it'll be fine, or whatever how to do it. Yeah. I am uh, too late now. <laughs> well, at least I'm not handing it to you, so we're okay there. Um, this is the body of Christ. In the tradition that was recorded back in Leviticus, um, I invite you to join me in partaking of the bread, the significance of being Christ's body that was nailed to a cross. our grape juice that we're about to 
drink today is, is representation of Christ's blood that was shed for us on the cross for the remission of sin so that we might have eternal life with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit for eternity. I ask you to join me. seats and we will uh, close with a uh, with a hand joke.